So here's a paradigm that existed back then and is pretty much what we do today. And I call it the make and fix paradigm. And it started off with data structures and procedures. They were like tinker toys, maybe a little bit like clocks. We fit, we make gears, we fit them together called APIs. They have to fit pretty closely for the thing to work. And that's pretty much the only architecture we have. And of course, you can make a tic-tac-toe computer out of Tinker Toy. This is Danny Hillis's. Has a few thousand Tinker Toy in it. But like such things, uh, it was once dismantled to be shipped to a museum. And when they put it back together, it never worked again. And the reason was it was just luck that all of these Tinker Toy actually worked because there was play. There were, there were strings inside the thing, and the strings weren't the same length anymore. And that reminds you of any programs. And this, is, uh, this murky thing is actually Mexico City. Has anybody ever been to Mexico City? So it's 20 million people. Couldn't be more smoggy. And it's kind of a mess. And it's just the kind of, it's just a slightly more extreme version of a lot of American cities. Um, where individuals have, carpenters have decided to do a house here or a house there. And the problem is, is that each individual little ant doing something has led to a totality that is almost unbearable and yet 20 million people are forced to live in it. And to me this is what software today is kind of like basically using almost the exact same architectures as were known uh, 50 years ago because even the so-called object-oriented languages today have lots of setters in the objects and when you have a setter in an object you've turned an object back into a data structure and so you get this huge amount of scaling of complications but uh, you don't get a lot of bang for the buck it's not clear what to do with it. But, whoop. Yeah, so if we look at software in terms of lines of code, for instance, a one book of software is about 20,000 lines of code, and a foot of books is about, I, I have it here. A meter is about a million lines of code. So if you stack up a meter's high, high of book, it's about only a million lines of code. Okay, so if we look at some software systems, for instance, Vista has 120 million lines of code in it, so that's 120 meters of books to read and 6,000 books and another 140 million for the apps, another 7,000 books. So we're talking 13,000 books for the simplest part of personal computing that we're all used to. Anybody here read 13,000 books? Anybody here read one book? <laughs> okay, just checking. So there's a lot. And I know a big software company whose name you might have heard that uh, has to deal with uh, a live base of about 350 million lines of code and, as they say, about 145,000 screens. So screens is a term that was used a long time ago for 3270 terminals. And so if they call their user interface today made out of screens, it's probably that they just adapted those old 3270 screens. So this is about 17,500 books worth of software. Nobody in that company knows what it is, but they have thousands and thousands of people maintaining it. So the question we should be asking as computer scientists first, let alone engineers, but as computer scientists we should be asking, is that how much software we have to write to get that much uh, functionality? Or is something wrong? 
So one way of looking at it is, if, here are two curves. So the complication curve here, uh, I just put up, uh, you know, about a, a factor of 100, this. And so we could see that while we'd like the complication curve to run at the same rate as the complexity curve, it actually is way ahead of the game. So for a certain level of complexity, like say in personal computing, the, com the actual complication might be a factor of 100 or a factor of 1,000. Like all but one-tenth of 1% 1 in the Microsoft software suite might be uh, useless code. Code that is there perhaps for compatibility reasons. Code that they don't dare take out. In fact, I know that, uh, for example, if everybody here has probably used Microsoft Word, and it's quite surprising that Microsoft Word, when you have paragraph justification on, actually has selection errors to this day. Have you ever had that happen? Got justification on, you click in there and, and you start typing and the typed character goes somewhere else. That bug has been there for more than 25 years. It's been reported literally 30 or 40,000 times and they cannot find the bug. <laughs> this is the most elementary thing that you ever do in a word processor is to be able to select where you want the character to go. They can't find it and in fact I've heard that part of Microsoft Word's listing has actually been lost. They've had to recreate it from, uh, from assembly code. So that's kind of a state of affairs that we probably should be thinking about because when you start getting into factors of 100 and factors of 1,000 and factors of 10,000, we're actually talking about the difference between somebody being able to comprehend something and maybe not be able to comprehend it at all. So if we go back to our diagram here, we can pick up some issues that we might care about. And I'll say something about the communication with aliens issue a little bit later, what that is. And if we look in this morass of stuff, there's one interesting thing that isn't like this, that is huge, and yet it is tidy its level of complication exactly balances its level of complexity, and that's the internet. So it's worthwhile thinking about that, that even in a poorly done C program, the internet is actually controlled by less than 20,000 lines of code itself, and that 20,000 lines of code can be written in about 1,000 lines of code. So TCP IP is a kind of a universal DNA for an architecture of billions of nodes in a dynamic system that has never been stopped. It has never been stopped from when it first got turned on in September 1969. It's replaced all of its atoms at least once and has never been stopped. It has been changed. It has been improved. But in fact, it's an eternal system. It is scaled well and so forth. And I'm not talking about the web, of course. The web is a mess. But the internet was done by experts. You had a couple of those guys, Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn, here at different times. These guys knew what they were doing. And boy, when you look at this, I think, why, does, why did the internet turn out so well? And why can't we do regular software that way? Because you could imagine taking the internet as a model for doing software modules. Why don't people do it? And so the way I look at it is a little jump of qualitative kind happened here and that jump is kind of a little jump from gear type things to biological type things. And in fact uh, those of us who had been biologists contributed some bio biological ideas to the design of the internet. Because of course the internet is one of the few human artifacts 
that we've made that behaves like, a bi like something that's alive in that it repairs itself while it is still running, it is able to expand and grow and so forth. And so we can think of the internet as in, it was made, but it has some of these biological ideas in it. So some of the same kinds of ideas for scaling were done in software also around the same time and some of those were successful um, at Xerox PARC but one of the problems of these some of these semi new ideas here is when they got translated into C based forms in order to be recognizable to people the things that were like this old paradigm were emphasized here so for example you got this really terrible idea of having a so-called object-oriented system and turning it back into data structures by putting setters in which allow the very same disastrous remote uh, assignment statements to to be done and turns the system into a much more fragile way of thinking about things but I think that what's actually going on here is that there's a new way of thinking about things that represents a brighter future for programming and if this is make and fix for instance you can fix a clock but you have to negotiate with the system so at some point the systems are too complicated for a human being to go into too many feedback loops too many self-regulatory systems and stuff and you wind up at best negotiating with the system now the stuff we're doing in here so far is in between we built it by hand but we made a system as we've made many other systems in software but we haven't made the systems capable enough to be able to be negotiated with so I just want to have you think a bit in your head of what it would be like if you're doing a software system in some new form of development uh, interactive development kit what would that software system actually do besides just doing what you asked it to do could it for instance participate in readapting the software for future needs about eighty percent of the cost of all software that is uh, deployed in industry comes after the software has been successfully uh, put out the first time so the life cycle changes that are required of the software and the integration and reintegrations actually dominate all the costs of software uh, but because of the way uh, companies uh, have to report their earnings and their expenses companies cannot charge up front for all of the stuff that you really need to do to software to allow it to be changed downstream so what they tend to pay for is just enough money to make the thing run to its original specs and hardly any money to be able to fix it up later because they just amortize those costs to the future and the costs are enormous so if we take the internet as one area and then a slightly more advanced way of thinking about things is that once we start thinking in biological terms we also are thinking about ecologies and I hope many of you have thought enough about the internet to realize that there are levels of communication protocols that could be put on top of TCP IP for example interoperation protocols that could eliminate the dependence on uh, specific operating systems and I hope to get to that uh, in a few minutes okay way down the road what is actually being put together is something that is going to have to be discussed in psychological or mental terms because the if this is manipulation up there is meaning 
So we can think of making progress in computer science along the no notions of scaling and programming as trying to move out of the realm of having to manipulate things and into the, into the realm of being able to express meaning. And I put a little S on the end here because it's not going to be just one kind of mind out there. <clears throat>